Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to uh, put the slide deck up. I'm afraid the um, the visuals you're about to see now are not as good as the ones you've just seen a second ago <laughs> for Cruella, which are much more interesting. Um, but hopefully they will take you through at least um, what's going on in the world of cinema, uh, what's been going on in the world of cinema. Can you just confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, we can. Jolly good. So I've had two years now to look at um, the impact of COVID on cinema and to come up with some sort of idea. Uh, cinemas have reopened around the world um, to see where cinema is recovering. Um, so I'll start with what happened two years ago. Well, obviously, um, cinema is shut. 97% of the world's cinemas shut down um, almost uh, within about two or three weeks. And we think that in about over about a three year period, cinemas will lose $57 billion of box office around the world. If you split that half and half broadly between cinemas and distributors, then both sides stand to lose well over $25 um, million, billion. Uh, and for cinemas, that doesn't include advertising and um, concessions, what they lost in terms of food and drink as well. So this is pretty significant. Uh, $58 billion that would have been in the, in the system, the cinema system is not there. We've had to readjust forecasts several times, um, given what you know, new variants come up and some are more serious and some are less serious. Um, but as things adapt, as things move, and as things adapt, uh, we have to look at um, how that's going to impact. But broadly speaking, we think that um, this year, we're going to be seeing about uh, 80, no, this year about 85% yeah, of box office compared to 2019. And then next year, we're back to um, not quite where we would have been uh, if it hadn't happened. Um, but we're back to a sort of a normal level of box office, which globally is around about $42 billion. So um, we think that there'll be a three to four year impact on um, the cinema business from COVID. But our prediction is that cinema will, um, be broadly speaking, back to the normal levels of box office uh, and emissions within about um, two years from now. If we look at last year, um, you can see very clearly that even despite that prediction, um, different countries have had different experiences. So Saudi Arabia is a new market. Uh, some of you may know that uh, three years ago, four years ago, cinema didn't exist in Saudi Arabia and the market has opened up uh, in the past three years. So new screens are being built and the market's still growing. Um, every other country in the world is not yet back to where it was in 2019. So we have Chile and China, Colombia, those countries had a very, very good uh, 2021. Um, in some cases, partly because that's such a bad 2020. Uh, but on the other end, you have countries in Europe, um, which were fairly mature markets anyway, um, but also Turkey, which had a very bad 2021. So not everyone by any means is out of the, out of the uh, or in the recovery phase for cinema, um, but some are. And if you look at the, the pink line, um, most of the countries are above zero in terms of the market, in terms of recovery from 2020. But it's only as good as the films on offer and films didn't really start last year until the summer. Um, I, I take the US mainly as a proxy here um, because I don't want to put every market that we cover. We covered 62 countries around the world. Um, so I'm using the US figures because they're the most available and also because um, they're, they're, they're quite high. Uh, but the films, the major films started around about July last year. And as you can see from the monthly um, attendance um, box office figures, the attendance started going up through the year. Um, and whereas we didn't really get back to 20, uh, 2019 figures, as the year went on, we had Venom, Bond, Spider-Man, we went up to uh, some fairly high levels compared to 2019. So you could argue that um, the US box office is recovering and on track to recover so maybe mid, uh, mid uh, way through this year. If we look at three countries, um, just to compare the US figures against other countries as well, um, look at the linear trend. It's a simple trend, I know it's a simplistic one. It does give you an idea. Uh, France, UK, US all had a trend upwards throughout the year. Uh, in fact, the UK had a very good September, October uh, with Bond and actually was 132% of his box office two years previously in 2019. So this shows us actually that if you have the right film, people go to the cinema. And while um, you know, not, all, not all the films are, can be popular and there is some hesitancy from, from people to get back to the cinema, in the right film puts people back in the cinemas. And that brings us to releases. If you look at the number of releases, so in a normal year 2019, um, you have studios releasing about 125, something like that, uh, wide releases in, in, in the USA. Uh, last year, 92, 
this year 101 with fixed dates plus 14 without dates or 115 or so so we're looking actually in terms of a release schedule we are definitely going back towards what would have happened before um, uh, the COVID hit you still have the winter effect so the January February this year is um, relatively uh, relatively calm um, you normally have the, the Oscar winning sort of the, or the Oscar hopefuls coming out in this this part of the year um, that hasn't really happened uh, and we have a, a very quiet start of year probably because winter last year was so um, so poor with cinemas um, but whereas the wide release films are coming back to some sort of normality, if you look at the, ho the whole market, again, the USA, um, but it does, you know, given the figures I've seen, it does represent other countries as well. This is the total number of films on release in a month. So they do cross over the, the, the same films in each month sometimes. But as a, as a guide to what distributors are doing, this shows very clearly that there's around half the number of films in the market that they, there was before. So whereas we know that the wide release films are there and they take most of the money, um, there's a lot of films that mid-level of films, which um, do well, you know, do pretty well, but don't do the top level. Uh, they're not there. So you have that, that sort of mid-level budget films. You have the, uh, the, the sort of global independent uh, titles, um, which are not back in the market. And that's sort of understandable. There's quite a risk in releasing, um, but um, you know, whether they come back or not remains to be seen. Exhibitors, well, exhibitors uh, actually have done pretty well. Not many have had to shut down, thank goodness, um, but there's been quite a lot of support for them uh, in place. So once support, deferrals, rent deferrals, furloughs, once those are finished, then what happens next? Well, you know, it's kept them going so far, um, but with debt financing and furloughs and things like that, you know, we have to ask this year, as those, um, those systems come to an end, where does that leave exhibitors? Well, the, the answer really is, it depends on the films. So we've seen that the films are out there, especially large films are out there. Um, it really relies on people going back to cinemas and keeping them open. What about windows? Well, we all heard a lot about windows. Um, and there was a lot of hyperbole around windows. My view is always that the theatrical window would, would, would remain. And um, broadly speaking, that's the case. Um, you have a shorter window, um, which is actually consistent with um, the way the market was moving anyway. Most films make um, a lot of their money within the first you know, four or five weeks. Um, so a shorter window wouldn't necessarily hurt the exhibitors' finances. Um, but that's come with sort of flexibility as well. So once the theatrical window is done, um, there's actually a lot more flexibility after that point in where things end up. And obviously they end up on streaming, whether that's um, a personal streamer that belongs to a studio or other streaming platforms. And there's a lot, of in, um, a lot of choice now for the post-theatrical market. But also said that internationally, it's quite complex. Um, you can't really have different window systems around for each country, for each exhibitor, for each studio. That becomes far too complex um, logistically. So yeah, there will be one system in place pretty much for, for, for films. And in conclusion, I would say that, um, I, I think that I, I hear a lot about streaming and um, you know, other parts, other home entertainment, kidding cinema. We've heard it a long time. I've been doing this for a long time and um, it hasn't happened yet. Um, usually VHS, DVD, other things help cinema, the symbiotic cinema. And in my view, streaming will also be symbiotic with cinema. Um, the only thing you can kill cinema really is cinema. Cinema doesn't invest, it doesn't keep offering a product that gives value, but also gives uh, experience. The key being here being experience for the consumer, then it, you know, it may go away. But um, at the moment, I think it's, I, I see no sign of that. And for me, the cinema is actually recovering pretty normally and um, pretty uh, as, expect, as expected. And uh, our view is that within about two years from now, uh, it should be back to where it was before. Thank you very much indeed. That was a very brief overview, I know, and I'll, I'll hand you back now and then um, we'll get on with the discussion part. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Do you want me to keep my video on or off? Um, and yeah, um, I have a few questions um, beginning uh, with you. Uh, thank sure. you for, as always, a very insightful presentation and uh, good to see you. Uh, for those who came in late, I keep uh, pestering David for expert comment on uh, various things uh, relating to- I wouldn't say European... pestering, no man, I wouldn't say pestering. <laughs> <laughs> pestering, yes, yeah. Um, so, um, so while you're with us, um, you mentioned that uh, there are, uh, you cover 62 uh, markets. Now, is India one of those markets? Uh, I ask simply because India is notoriously shy of 
uh, reporting box office uh, figures? It is one of those markets, um, but we um, there are quite a lot of market analysts in who cover India, and they cover it better than me because they that, that's what their job on a daily basis. I know I know quite a few of them, so we do cover India. Uh, we don't track box office though, so we're not we're not we're not box office trackers. We look at the market as as, as a whole. Um, but I would agree with you that finding box office figures in India is not the uh, easiest thing in the world to do. Right now, I'm going to go around everyone. Uh, just introduce yourself and uh, briefly uh, just let us let the audience know what your company does. Uh, let's start with David. For those who came in late, uh, what exactly does Omdia do? Well, Omdia, so I came out of um, Screen Digest, which was a, ma a magazine and company from the UK in the 90s, started in 1971, in fact. Uh, Screen Digest became uh, IHS Marketing, which became Omdia. And Omdia is a, uh, an events, publications, and research um, company in the whole range of well, media. We, we, obviously, my, my area covers media. We have a lot more than that as well. So uh, I specialize, um, we're, we're analysts in what I do. Um, so we analyze markets. All right. And um, uh, moving on to um, uh, Fazila, uh, can you, uh, what does your company do? Sure, Naman. Yeah, hi all. My name is Fazila Alana. I am the founder MD of Sol Productions Private Limited. We're a content production studio that makes shows for both uh, television as well as OTT platforms. Um, and uh, Gautam? I think you're muted. Hi, I'm Gautam. I head content for uh, an OTT platform in India called MX Player. All right, and uh, so I have a number of uh, questions. The first question uh, uh, David has just answered, which is with the COVID-19 lockdowns, how is the global cinema being impacted? So moving forward from there, uh, with uh, the advent of uh, streaming, you know, uh, what's the way forward? The reason I ask is because uh, at the end of David's presentation, you know, he said that, uh, you know, only uh, cinema can save cinema and, uh, uh, and there's lots of uh, streaming platforms, including MX Player. And in India, particularly, a lot of uh, theatrical films, uh, films spent for theatrical have gone directly to uh, streaming platforms. So um, uh, Fazila and uh, Gautam, what do you think is the, is the way forward? I mean, Fazila as a content producer and uh, Gautam as a platform. Gautam, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fadila. Uh, no, I I think what David is saying is right. I think only cinema can kill cinema. I don't think streaming is killing cinema for sure. I just think that it's a different uh, model that's evolved because of the pandemic. It was a very extreme circumstance by itself. Um, however, I do think that uh, you know moving forward, because of the kind of content that probably OTT uh, streaming platforms are actually producing and putting out there, I think cinema will have to rethink what is the kind of content strategy that they actually have coming out. I think uh, the pressure is now the reverse. I think we don't have the pressure. I think the cinema guys have the pressure to make sure that it's a lot more experiential kind of content because I'm not so sure. I think David can you know give us a little bit more understanding of what's actually happening in more developed markets, whether uh, cinema is becoming more experiential or is it still great storytelling that really matters? Because I think more and more moving into the future, uh, I don't know what space uh, indie cinemas and you know cinema with with a little bit of a mid level budgets are going to work like. Because uh, if if the OTD streaming is going to come up with stories that are uh, either better or equally good, uh, then I think the kind of cinema uh, viewing experience that a consumer is looking for, for which he has to now pay a decent sum of money, to be really honest. I mean, a, a cinema experience in India is. Uh, not cheap anymore, right? The tickets are expensive. The popcorn is equally expensive. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that unless until that experience, and you know, it was interesting to see that Spider-Man, Bond, and Venom were some of the shows that David talked about. And I think that those are really experiential films. They are not. They are not small films. They're huge budget films, and people are willing to pay them for that experience. So I don't think cinema is going anywhere for sure. But I just think that the kind of content that people are willing to pay for in cinemas is something that most movie producers uh, are going to be starting to uh, genuinely rethink on, on what is that story that really demands a theatrical experience versus you know what I can actually just sit and watch at home. 
And, and uh, before we go to uh, Fazila, David, do you want to address uh, Gautam's question of uh, whether cinema is an experiential, uh, you know, experience in in the developed markets uh, and what's happening? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very good point. So, past ten years, digital cinema essentially came in you know, between two thousand and seven and eight and two thousand and fifteen. When cinemas became digital, it offered a range of technology and premium different differential premium options within cinemas, and it's very clear that the sort of PLF, um, that sort of type premium large format cinemas, IMAX type stuff, is growing a lot. But it's still only about five five ten percent of the actual numbers of the screen base uh, is actually more prominent in terms of its re revenue. Um, but cinema is definitely becoming a more experiential. It's always been cinema experience has always been a term. Uh, but it's becoming a more experiential um, uh, um, sector, but it's not exclusively um, experiential. There is still a lot of screens and essentially just, uh, yeah, just normal screens, but that's could, that could be sort of slightly problematic because I think that the, the top 10, 20 films in most countries take you know, well over 70% of the, the, the revenues. Um, you know, these films are really driving the market forward. It's a very, very long tail in cinema. A lot of films don't do very well at all. And those films essentially are at risk within the cinemas because there's no particular economic model that's going to work for them. So I take his point entirely that you know, the, 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 the type of film that's going to work in cinemas and always has worked in cinemas will be actually pushed forward even more. And as I sort of mentioned, that, that sort of mid-level budget film is going to be squeezed. However, I would point out very quickly that the streamers themselves, certainly in the States, the, the bigger ones there, Netflix, Amazon, those people have, uh, especially Netflix, who's always been sort of slightly anti-cinema, They've recognised themselves that they need cinema. They've all they've all said they're going to go release theatrically themselves. Why? Because they see that streaming doesn't have the same cultural relevance and same global impact that cinema does, and they need that cultural relevance and global impact to get there to put, to push their if you like their, their services and to push their films. So they're going to start making films and releasing theatrically. Whether that's for real reasons, because like, economically they don't need the cinema, or whether that's for cultural relevance slash Oscar winning ambitions. Yeah, that's that's re re remains to be seen, but um, I think that there's an interesting sort of symbiosis I think developing now between streaming and cinema that we can't take for granted that, that they'll push mid-level budget films out of cinema. But I take go to the point entirely that you know that those films might struggle to find their, their audience in cinema. Thank you, uh, Fa Fazila. No, uh, so I agree with both of them. I think uh, cinema is here to stay. And as the person who loves going to the cinema, I definitely hope it's here to stay. But I think it is because I think, you know, there's that much, honestly, one can sit at home and keep watching on a laptop and a TV. You do need to go out. You do need to socialize. Theater is a very important part of that. It's, a, it's an outing for an entire family. It's, it's, a, it's a place where everyone meets their friends. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, um, lots of uh, romances start in theaters. I don't think theaters are going and cinema is going anywhere, but I do agree that it is the larger scale uh, films that will have more traction uh, and maybe some of the more heavy concept driven, smaller budgeted films would uh, would probably just target the OTT platforms as opposed to go theatrical. Great. And um, uh, while staying on the subject, uh, specifically uh, Gautam and uh, Fazila, what lessons uh, uh, what future proofing lessons have we learned in the last two years? Now, because now we, we cannot say, even though here in the, U, in the UK, the government has said that COVID is over, COVID is not over. Uh, if, you, if you believe uh, uh, the administration here, and if you look, uh, I was on the tube this morning, uh, people have thrown caution to the winds. Um, but that's not the case in the rest of the world. There could be another variant, uh, you know, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, uh, who knows. So as uh, people working in the industry, you know, on a, uh, literally getting your hands dirty every day, what lessons uh, have you learned in the last two years that you will take forward to uh, negate uh, or at least uh, kind of soften the effect of any future uh, COVID stoppages? I, I think the biggest lesson I think we've learned as the, uh, human beings is that uh, we do need to figure out how to deal with COVID, right? We, we, we need to accept the fact it's around. We need to take the right precautions. Uh, we need to, um, but we don't need to stop work anymore. Okay, so we need to continue. And I think uh, now, even with the new variant, uh, I think people uh, will be more cautious, will be uh, more careful. But I, I, I personally feel that it's not going to stop. Like at least in India, 
uh, Omicron did not actually stop anything. Yes, uh, Delta did, uh, but Omicron didn't. So I think at least in India, we're a resilient race of people and we will continue to battle through this. What do you say, Gautam? Yeah, no, I kind of agree with Sajid. I think the last two years, I mean, all our uh, all our slates have, have been pushed and pulled in various directions. We've had, uh, until, Omicron, um, until Omicron actually happened, we were like, okay, now at least now we're all okay. We'll go back to shoot. Let's try and do it. Uh, and then Omicron hits and she's right. I mean, it's just that the learning curve is now pretty uh, decent. I guess we are all vaccinated to whatever effect it has. But the fact is that yes, because filmmaking and you know whatever we make is 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 a uh, is at least 150, 120 people on set at any given point in time. It does have its own impact, and you know one person getting infected has its impact on others. So I think if the if if I if I read the experts right, what they've been saying for the last at least three months is that now living with it means three months up and three months down. You just don't know which three months is up and which three months is down. <laughs> you just have to just figure that out and. Uh, Try and plan accordingly. I think Fazila has a larger, uh, you know, battle because she's literally on the ground, making sure that you know you're actually doing it within the you know norms that are decided. And you know, every government is different. I mean, they take it differently. We take it differently. I guess world takes it differently. But yes, uh, in a nutshell, it has impacted massively. It has pushed a lot of content pieces. Uh, uh, you know. It's bunched it all up together. I think what you're going to be seeing even in theaters is that everything that did not release for the last two years will try and find its own release uh, Fridays. And every Friday is going to be fighting. We, we uh, as an in OTT uh, industry, are about, we're about 30 of us. We're going to be fighting every Friday. The films are going to be fighting every Friday. So every Friday is going to be massive for, for everybody in, in, in India. It's just that uh, it just gets, uh, everything just gets expensive. Media gets expensive, advertising gets expensive, everything gets, just gets expensive. So yeah, we'll have to put those learnings in, in, in place and, and try and see, you know, how, how best can we understand this play at its, at, its, at its very best? Because a lot of big films have uh, waited for, for to find that theatrical release. They're still waiting uh, in the right uh, sense and uh, all the backlog will all, all will have to find 2022 releases and there are only 52 weeks so uh, eventually that's going to be the tough battle i guess for all of us the, the reason i asked you that question was that uh, uh, you know yesterday we, we did a story on um, uh, yesterday was a day when all the covid restrictions pretty much stopped in the uk and uh, so we spoke to a cross section of uh, you know uk producers etc and um the basic message is no one is uh, stopping, at least from, from a film and high-end TV production point of view, no one is stopping the safety uh, requirements. Uh, they, are, they, are continuing, uh, they are continuing that. And um, so is that uh, continuing in uh, India as well? Yes, very much so. And, and that would be a prudent thing to do, actually. Uh, you know, it's better to uh, err on the side of caution as opposed to throw caution to the wind completely. So I think it, it would be uh, better for everyone to follow the right protocols. Uh, I think pretty much uh, going forward for a long time, it's going to be like this. Okay, that's good to know. So um, moving on to my next question. Um, so now with, um, it's a very broad question. What kind of uh, content works in India with such a broad market? And... Um, Again, I have a specific reason for asking you uh, this question because MX Player, uh, you know, addresses a certain uh, segment of the market. Uh, I two weeks ago I did a story on there's a about a huge boom in streamers that cater specifically to language specific markets. For example, there are twelve uh, streamers catering to Bengali, you know, three from Malayalam uh, and uh, two in Gujarati. Now, so and the people only talk about the uh, the Netflixes and Amazons uh, and so uh, Disney Plus Hotstar. So generally, um, and David as well, you know, from uh, from a general uh, market uh, overview point of view, what do you think is uh, working in the Indian market, and uh, how does uh, how do you cater, how do you solve a problem like India? Anyone? Yeah. Well. Uh... You know, uh, as far as MX is concerned in India, I think we are the, probably the second after YouTube in terms of sheer reach. 
you know, we've got about 280 million monthly actives. So that's large, right? Uh, given any <laughs> stretch of imagination in this country. Uh, and that what, what it does for us is it gives us a, a understanding across uh, a very large sample base, right? Uh, simply because we, we're probably the only one in the country, actually we are the only one who actually are on an award platform. Therefore, sampling of content is very, very large given the distribution and reach of our channel. Um, and because we are that large, right, uh, we obviously are mass. Therefore, the cohort that we look at is, and we're proudly mass actually, to be honest with you, right? Uh, we're not niche at all and we don't have any uh, impediments to actually sampling our content simply because it's free um, the fact and to actually be able to watch premium content free does, is not uh, an option in this country apart from mx to be honest again there are freemium models which are actually catch-up television and everything that is actually premium is behind a paywall uh, unlike mx which is actually free for 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 all uh, so I guess what, uh, in terms of what is the kind of content that, that really works is that we genuinely believe that India is too large, right? Uh, there are countries within countries within countries. I think every state in India would be equivalent to a European country for sure. Uh, and if that is the fact of the matter, then there is enough in a large population to cater to. So I think the tough part about creating that content strategy, right, is that what is mass? Uh, how does it appeal to which kind of cohort, which kind of audiences? We have very different kind of audiences, but largely if you look at the internet in this country, right? The internet itself in India is largely male skewed, um, which is like more than 70% of the people who are accessing uh, digital entertainment are males. Uh, it could be 30 or 35% for women, but the fact is that the data is skewed again because most women don't have their own email IDs. They have their husbands or their brothers and you know stuff like that. So there is a little bit of a you know data kind of a jumble there but yeah it's safe to say that it's still uh, the younger population uh, 18 to 35 male is what uh, indian digital entertainment audience really is and uh, it's fairly safe to say that i think most of us are trying to cater to that particular audience unless until of course i'm specifically um, you know s word and maybe netflix and amazon i don't know what they're I think the slight, I'm, it's obvious it's a slightly more premium audience that they go after because of the kind of subscription, uh, you know, rates that are existing in the market. So uh, it's very, it's very, very difficult. It's too large a country, to be honest with you. But I think uh, it's safe to say that uh, that's the kind of largest cohort that I think most people would want to go after uh, if you actually want to become a mass entertainment channel in this country. And that's exactly what MX is really going after. Thank you. Uh, Fazla? So, I, you know, uh, I think there's a learning from even television over here, even for the OTTs. And uh, a lot of Indians like to consume uh, content in their home language or in their mother tongue, so to speak. And uh, as uh, Gautam rightly said, India is, is pretty much uh, every state of India is the size of uh, a European country. And, and every state in India speaks a different language. So there is definitely a lot of opportunities for regional OTTs to be powerful players in their states and cater to that state as well as the diaspora of that language across the world. So like, for example, Saul uh, has been producing quite actively for AHA in the Telugu language and the response is great. I mean, uh, you know, um, our, our recent show did extremely well and it hit uh, like 9 million viewers on uh, just the uh, Telugu OTT. So I think there's more than enough opportunity. I don't know whether there's space for 12 people, but uh, definitely space for at least four to five regional OTT players per language, uh, in my opinion. All right. So, uh, David, um, any thoughts on any overview uh, thoughts? Yeah, so... So Fazila just mentioned there's a parallel with TV for OTT players. And I think there's actually a parallel with cinema for, for these players as well. If you go back to the 1990s, um, everything goes back to cinema for me, just so you know. <laughs> the 1990s, you had um, basically all cinemas targeted studios and cinemas targeted 18 to 35. Advertisers wanted them and you know, concessions were spend and all the films were aimed at teenagers, basically, and slightly above. But growth, you know, the, 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 the need for growth and the need for your shareholders and other people to see growth in you means you have to go wider than that at some point. And in the late, late 90s, early 2000s, the studios all the studios and independent producers started to, to build um, sort of specialty units. 
they called them, but essentially what they were doing was, it was creating content for older audiences, uh, cinema content for older audiences, because they had to widen the demographic. If you focus on the demographic specifically, at some point, your people, the people who want to see growth around you say, you've got to go wider than that because we need to bring new people in. You're going to, at some point, get reach that's a saturation point with the target market you've got. So I can, I think that um, from that point of view, from that lesson, you know, if you have a target market, it's fine. We will need only target markets, but there's some, there will be requirements to go wider than your target market at some point because you need to achieve growth. And actually, for cinemas, it was very healthy. It actually achieved a much broader spread and a much broader demographic for them and a much broader range of advertising that's on cinemas and a much broader range of content uh, within the cinema. Right, so I have... Two questions are, that are related to each other for specifically for Fazla and Gotham. Uh, are we seeing a rise in budget allocations? And does that lead to you know, uh, better VFX uh, quality? As in, uh, obviously, you must be open to experimenting with uh, better VFX, but that needs money. Uh, so are you seeing, uh, uh, has the pandemic affected budgets or hasn't it? What, what's the answer? Oh, God. Well, budgets are on an increase for <laughs> with or without pandemic. I don't think that's really <laughs> it. The fact of the matter is that uh, there is a very simple demand supply situation, which is uh, skewed towards a very, very large appetite for content from the Indian consumer and the supply being limited, to be really honest, because it's not, I mean, we are the biggest, uh, you know, film industry in the world producing about thousand films a year, right? And uh, I genuinely believe that the talent is still limited in terms of because we operate, there's a large HSM belt, which we call the Hindi belt. And then there are, of course, regional cinemas. We have regional shows, very large regional shows as well. Uh, but the fact is that the budgets are increasing because to be really honest with you, it's just that the number of players have increased. Uh, the demand for that content has definitely increased because streaming is a new habit that is being actually formed in this country as we speak. Uh, we're about three to four years old, to be really honest with you. I think our first originals would have come out about three to four years back, not too long back. Uh, the consumer is shifting. There are TV cord cutters uh, that have just happened, right? So therefore, there are enough people that are now moving and there's a habit change that is actually happening. So uh, also the fact that, please be rest assured that most Indian consumers are uh, sampling global content. Piracy is massive in this country. We are not used to paying for content uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, most youngsters uh, find their way out. They find the way to get to those shows. And the fact that they are exposed to all the large international formats and the large international shows uh, basically means that, yes, their exposure to very high-end VFX is already there. So we cannot uh, then dish out things which are slightly on the lower side as well. Because the expectations now are saying that, okay, guys, if I'm watching that, then you might as well, you know, that's a $250 million film, but it doesn't matter because it's not their life. It's not their, theirs to figure out, right? They're saying, okay, that's the level, now you match it up. Uh, very difficult to be honest with you. But if you're asking us whether the budgets are increasing, yes, they are. Uh, intent to get better VFX, yes, for sure. Uh, will we get there? Uh, yes, we will. It'll take us some time, uh, is what uh, I think my take right now is for Mass India. I genuinely represent Mass India, so I, I can only talk from that filter right now. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Fazila? Uh, so, I think definitely uh, budgets are, are increasing. I think uh, more by the more premium uh, OTTs at the moment, uh, because they seem to have a bigger coffer and more time. So the, one of the big challenges with VFX is also the time it takes to produce anything, right? Goes up. And the chase to get content out right now is pretty furious. So it's it's always a battle. I think, uh, as Gautam said, once uh, things settle down a bit, I think this will, VFX uh, and producing uh, content, which is very he heavy VFX driven, will also open up. But I think it'll still take some more time in India. We're there, but we use VFX in, in much smaller ways right now, as opposed to, uh, I mean, just take the example of uh, the Dharma production movie, Brahmastra, right? Just that one movie it has gone on for like, has changed their, their, their uh, 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 cinema date some three times already because the VFX are not over. So you've really got to have that kind of a capacity to 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 be that kind of a studio that can afford the time uh, uh, and therefore directly the money that goes into making a really strong and heavy VFX film in India today still. 
It's interesting you uh, mentioned Brahmastra because uh, uh, I spoke to Ayan a, uh, a month ago and he said that uh, the kind of uh, money uh, that you spend in Hollywood uh, and the kind of money, uh, what you can get, your dollar goes a long way in India. So uh, does, doesn't that help, uh, you know, the homegrown films like uh, Brahmastra and, uh, you know, the projects that the, the two of you work on? Well, it depends on, on, on therefore, the platform and whether that uh, dollar is available or not uh, <laughs> uh, effectively. So, yes, so for an Amazon or a Netflix, they might be willing to put in that time and that money, uh, but not necessarily for all the platforms, I would say. Gautam? No, yeah, I, I think I agree with Fazila. I think that we have to still understand that storytelling format. I think that expertise lies here. A lot of it is outsourced. Most of the VFX for most of the people outside of uh, even Hollywood productions are done out of India. Uh, there are massive production uh, facilities available. There's talent available. But I think that the, the, that the dollar spent is also not uh, that cheap, to be really honest with you. So I think that, uh, yes, it is definitely better than what, uh, what a dollar would get you uh, probably in developed markets. Uh, but the fact is that you have to be really committed to that kind of a show. I think once you're committed to that kind of a show, then I guess it's, 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 I don't think we even uh, look at, uh, so we don't have, uh, I'm just trying to think about where the VFX, for example, we don't have very large superhero uh, shows as of right now. We don't have dystopian worlds stories yet. Uh, whether we're getting there, yes, we are. Are we going to experiment with them? Yes, we will. Uh, will VFX play a very, very important role in that? Yes. I think currently the, the biggest part of VFX, I think is, I think television experiments a lot with the VFX, with, with a lot of mythologies that we do in our uh, television world. I don't think we still have had that experience. Bahubali was a massive VFX uh, film that we had here, which did very, very well for that matter. Uh, but they are few and far in between. That level of commitment to be able to do that kind of genre is still not very, very prevalent right now. Uh, but I'm sure I think most of the platforms are going to be experimenting with it um, full-fledgedly very, very soon. That's good because uh, there are questions coming in thick and fast for you, Gautam, uh, uh, from the audience, uh, which is uh, one of them is, uh, do you plan to invest more in VFX heavy content? Uh, Netflix has its own VFX department. Will MX Player also have its own VFX division in the coming future? And um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, some more for you, but uh, if you can answer yeah, these no, two first. We, we, we've experimented with the, with the mythology show called Sai. We did experiment with a bit of VFX because it's a mythology show. There are some you know miracles that need to be performed and stuff like that. So we, we've tried that um, uh, successfully so in, a, in our own ways. Uh, will we open our own VFX? Uh, no, we won't. I think that we're a platform. We're not a production uh, company or production facility as such uh, till we don't see ourselves really really having a very large slate of content pieces that actually requires the vfx i don't think we will be investing uh, on our own i think we'll just partner uh, with the best vfx facility that 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 is available for uh, us to work with depending on the project that we get for sure and maybe fazila can answer the next uh, uh, question which is also coming from the audience uh, uh, which is, uh, sorry, this is not for Faisal, this is for David specifically. Do you think the event uh, films being produced in India are doing justice to the quality versus event films being produced in the West, considering that we are producing it for one-tenth the budget? Uh, I think you're on mute. I am on mute, quite right, thank you. How many times have I heard you're on mute in the past two years? And it's usually me. Um, so... Uh, Yes, probably, because to be honest, the Indian box office is about $2 billion well, um, annually. Uh, American box office is about $11 billion annually. Okay, that's not one tenth, and I can see that, that's 20%. 20, 20 um, but they're, they're doing different things as well. They're different films, they're different budgets, different types of film. The, the, the type of money that has been spent on an event film in the States, maybe 20, 25 a year. You know, that's, that's only they can do it. And why? Because they have a global capacity to distribute film. They're the only people in the world who can globally distribute film. So they can, they, they have, the, they have the, the ability to monetize back, you know, to get the revenue back and maximize the revenues from that. Um, so they have, a, they have a global audience, whereas Indian films don't have a global audience that way. So yeah, I think you're doing 
pretty well. With, you know, that, that's essentially the budget level it should be. And um, it seems to do pretty well. Yeah, Naman, Anil here. Can I step in here? You know, what's of happened today? Can. Yeah. We had uh, Vikram Bhatt today on, and he's totally taken up to the virtual uh, production side, as well as we have using a lot of virtual production, uh, using Unreal. With Unreal taking up so much of attention from filmmakers, uh, as well as from OTT side, and there are, you know, there are cheaper ways of doing virtual productions uh, being thought up in India. So uh, the involvement of virtual production is going to really increase in India. Is that an aspect you've covered so far? Uh, somebody did ask uh, that question uh, early on about virtual production, and uh, I think uh, someone answered that we it's still not very prevalent in India. It's not very prevalent anywhere. I mean, it's 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 um it's it's coming up. It's there. And I think probably the COVID shows actually the, the type of uses it can have actually in this type of world that we're in the moment. So virtual production does something very very different and uh, does it uh, very um, socially distanced as well. Um, but it is quite complicated, from my understanding. So virtual production requires a the, the the studios to do it. There's only I think about five studios probably in the world that you can currently do it, and it's it's pretty complicated to do. So virtual production to me seems to be a part of the mix of going forward. So it'll take away some location shooting. I think the, what I can sense from I'm not an expert in this, but what I can sense from people that do it. They say actually what it does very, very well is it gets rid of really complicated and also difficult film sh shoots. So things like The Revenant, The Revenant with you know, so the, the film, that film there was, you know, the actors were, say, were outside in freezing conditions. They didn't want to do it, but it was, it was hard, it was hard work. And they all said, never again, we'll do that again. You know, if you can do that in virtual, virtual production studio rather than actually being out there in the woods for 20 hours a day, that sort of thing, you can actually make films you, you wouldn't make otherwise because it's not physically possible to do for, for people to actually endure. Um, so that sort of area at the moment seems to be where they're focusing virtual production rather than just sort of going on location and shoots. Yeah, but I'll tell you what's happening now. Unreal Engine is really pushing, Epic is really pushing in India aggressively. Over the, over the past year, we've had so many new, uh, you know, uh, uh, producers and directors starting to think in that direction. So Vikram is directing for OTT, Vikram is directing films. And as a, there are studios which have come up in, uh, uh, in, in Chennai as well, in Hyderabad as well, which are actually encouraging the uh, environments which are available in the uh, Unreal Engine rather than the VFX kind of things which you, can, which you can do with Unreal. So that's something which is really beginning to take off in there. So I tend to think there's going to be an, an explosion over the next one to two years in India in that area. So I don't know Naman. if anyone agrees, disagrees, Fazila or Gautam or Naman himself or David. Fazila? Um, so I'm still not exposed to this Unreal technology. Uh, so I will have to take a rain check on this question till I study it a little more. So, you know, Sorry, uh, just, just give an example, David. In India, they're not using the high-end LEDs. They're, you know, volumetric, they're not using the high-end yeah. LEDs. They're not, they're not going for expensive row LEDs. They're going for cheaper LEDs, which are used for events. And they're getting good results in India. We know how to do jugar, as we call it. So we are, we are doing a lot of jugar for that. And then the results are outstanding. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I didn't know there was quite so much activity in India about that area. I can understand why, because there's quite a lot of technology prowess and expertise in India. So I can see that actually would, would be very useful. Um, so now I, just, I, I take that on board. I know that um, and I'm looking into it myself. The rest of the world, I can see there is an interest in it, but I can also see that there is, for Zilla's point is, at the moment, not many people know how to do it or have, have done it. Therefore, there's a learning curve, quite a steep learning curve. And also at the moment, because still quite a lot of emphasis on location shoots and tax credits and incentives, the whole the whole sort of um, global system of um, film production will have to change to accommodate things like virtual production. And I'm just while I can see the technology does allow you to do things, it doesn't always mean that they will be done. Yeah, yeah, so but India has never I'm, I'm taken advantage of co-production treaties. We've never had reciprocal. Naman can tell you a lot about that also. He's been covering. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it. Um, uh, I can tell you, uh, since uh, you know, India and the UK, just to take two countries, signed a co-production treaty more than 10 years ago, the grand total of official co-productions under the treaty is one. Yeah. Yes. On that. The tax credits don't really work out very well and all that. We're not looking for that. So, And you know what, what Vikram said today is that uh, Unreal Engine uh, is actually flattening uh, the, 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 the creative curve 
for you know you don't have to be a big filmmaker to make a large looking film you can be a small independent filmmaker who can use unreal and create a large looking film or ott show you know a big they said that about they said that they said that about digital te technology for film digital production as well that it essentially democratizes production but you still find there's still there's still have the same filmmakers who who control and dominate the film industry it's not so much about the ability to do it it's a great question of how they do it and then how other people res re respond to that so while I've taken entirely taken board what you're saying, and there's there's definitely a just because it can be done doesn't say it will be done. That's what I'm saying. But I'm I'm going to go away and look at the Indian example you, you've quoted there because that's very interesting. Yeah, you should also look at what Minal Murari did. That's a Malayalam film, which has uh, done real world effects, etc. And it's also used cheap ways of getting uh, visual effects and done a very great job of it. So Gautam can tell you more about it since you would have seen the film. Uh, David, yeah. uh, he's talking about. Uh, uh, a film called Minal Murali, which is a Malayalam language film, which premiered on Netflix uh, about uh, four, four or five weeks ago, uh, made in South India for, again, as in a, in a fraction of the budget that, uh, you know, most superhero films are made on. Um, and I think- Well, uh, yeah, but so just to come back, actually, just, just briefly, most films aren't superhero films. You know? most, there are, there are 9,000 feature films made in the world each year, and that's doubled in 20 years. Right, so that's the most most films are not superhero films. Twenty films a year, no, not even a year. Sorry, you know, ten films a year are superhero films. You've probably got twenty-five films that would classify as tentpole films. That leaves you with eight thousand nine hundred seventy-five films that are made in the world that aren't those films. So the rest of the world is not superhero films. The rest yeah, of the world action. Is... There's a lot of action. There's a lot of you know shots which you don't want to use. You don't want to shut down the streets of New York. It's too expensive to do a shot. And these days, what's happening is because of uh, LED walls and volume production, you can actually, you don't have to go to Swift to the ads to do a shoot with, like, you know, the Hindi filmmakers used to do. Now you can do that. You can project uh, onto the LED and you can shoot in Mumbai. And you can set a, you know, a, a stage with, you can build a stage in that. So that's what's changing the way filmmakers in India are looking at it. Yeah, no, I see that. And that's the, that, that is very exciting. Uh, virtual production to me is something I've, I've looked at. And it's, it's very exciting. It does, it does change how filmmakers can approach the types of films and projects they can make. It does allow you to do things they couldn't do before with a budget. I've just been looking at Brazil, for example, and the average feature film budget in Brazil is $800,000. And, you know, it doesn't give you much leeway to go around the world and start doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you can start doing things virtually and you, take, you can take the Brazilian concept and put it somewhere else, then that's very exciting. So I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not, I don't believe that virtual production, I do very much believe it, but because of, because of the expertise level at the moment, it's not what most people are doing. I'm actually crossing over time. No, Naman, sorry to disrupt your panel. No problem. I, I was just going to say that we are, yeah. we are now officially 10 minutes over time. So, uh, oh, sorry. It's time to, <laughs> and thank you for sharing this. Really appreciate it. And everyone who came on the panel. Thank you, Naman. Thank you, Anil. My best to My like. pleasure. My as best always. To like. Yeah, yeah well. And, um, and uh, th thank you, everyone, for giving up your valuable time. Uh, David, uh, hopefully, I'll see you in real life. Uh, uh, somewhere soon in London. I hope so. We're just down the road, so let's let's catch up. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all of you. Thanks, Gautam, and everyone. Thanks.